Well, good day to those of you joining us for this parable study. Uh, we are thankful and we are grateful and we hope to bring insight to your understanding, um, not just of biblical things, but of the nature of God and what it is he requires of us as his, uh, his children, his sons, his daughters. So we hope that in our uh, discussion of this parable tonight that we will name in a moment, that you indeed will go along with us, follow with us, and as you do, pray that the Lord will give you insight, that he would open your heart in order that your mind may be enlightened. If you would do that, we would be grateful and God will show us the way. So uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Ben, would you open us in prayer, yes, please? Yes, Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for setting apart this time for us to study your word, Father God, and uh, to study um, the secrets of these parables, Father God. I ask that you would... Um, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon each one of us, Father God, that, that we would uh, look at your word rightly and discern it correctly, Father God, uh, that we might grow in your kingdom and, and uh, those that might find this uh, and watch it later would, uh, would be increased for your glory, Father God. The idea here is to draw cl closer to you, Father God. So that's what we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Well, before we get started, let's uh, go around and introduce ourselves and let the, uh, those watching and the audience know who we are and kind of what we do around this church body. We'll start with you ladies, whichever one of y'all want to go first. All right. My name is Diana Dabbs. Um, we are newlyweds. We just, sorry, we're newlyweds. We just got married in February. I've been at this church probably since I was born. Amen. Like I might have been born on the pew. I don't know. <laughs> Close. <laughs> but I've been here for a while. Got to see my parents um, come, for where, come from where we are right now and move up. So I got to see their walk and how it's supposed to look. And, yeah, I do a few things around the church, just volunteering with the ladies group. And we're still trying to find out what season we're in and what things we like, so. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dion. I'm Jessica Roberts, um, married to Ben. Um, we have three kids. I'm a, currently a stay-at-home mom, um, but come up here and work. I fill in for the secretary when she's out and, um, and involved in several auxiliaries and um, in the leadership. And we've been here 17 18 years later on this year, so. Amen. Well, thank you, Jessica. Gentlemen, whichever one of you would like to go first. Um, I'm Jaquavian Dabbs, uh, known as Quavo. Um, this is my wife, of course, as she mentioned. Um, I've been coming to True Light for about three years, in which I was introduced to True Light through my wife, and I was just intrigued on her gifts and the way she carried herself, and then she informed me that True Light was was the place who taught her these ways. So that's how I got here. Well, thank you. And so I'm glad so much to have the four of you here with me to talk about this parable. And it, this is the parable of the master and his servant. Now, I, wanna, I want you guys to help clarify some groundwork before we dive off into this parable. Because when people, especially people of color, hear the word master and servant, they start possessing a kind of slave master mentality. Is this what that is? I don't believe so. Okay. Help me, help us to see, help the audience and those that are listening and watching to understand what it is we're dealing with here. How do you see it? I, I, I would say it's a fine line uh, between it, but uh, the difference what we think is slavery, American slavery, and, and what they're talking about servant here is uh, this person wants to do this, right? right? Uh, whether they put themselves, you know, in, in Bible times, sometimes they put themselves in a bad situation and they had to do that, but it was always for a certain period of time um, and it was for a goal, you know? Um, and the Jews did it a lot different than the Americans Amen. did it, you know? But uh, yeah, for, for the most part, these people want to be a part of being a servant. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You have and, a word on that? Yeah, and just off the, the slave and the servant or the slave part, it's more of a, I like to think of it a tense word as a, as a, as a servant, as a, as a helper, as a, as a person that's, 
that's a sign to do a job. So, you know. That's, that's very good. We could also relate it to um, an employer-employee kind of relationship, which um, uh, would also fit uh, the scenario. But it has always been in the, in the history of, of human beings, people who have owned other people. Was that necessarily God's intent? No, because it was mishandled from the beginning. It was mishandled. Doesn't matter what ethnicity that owned another ethnicity or propagated such a kind of display of ownership, that kind of thing, God never really intended at all to happen. So I just wanted y'all to help me kind of clarify that Amen. so that those who are watching can will understand what we're talking about. And in this parable found in the 17th chapter of the book of Luke, beginning at verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, beginning at verse 7, going through verse 10. But interesting enough, uh, ahead of this parable, he's talking about forgiveness. And he's talking about how many times a person should forgive his brother, someone that has harmed him. And I want to go up to verse 5 and 6 and kind of go down to verse 7. Okay. It talks about the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What is faith? How can you explain to the listener, in a simple way, what faith is? Believing in something higher than yourself. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Believing in something that you can't physically see or it's not there right now, but you, okay. you have, a, have it in your heart and your mind that it will come to. Or okay. It will unfold. Very good. Let me ask you this. Do you think all men have faith? something yes not necessarily God but what are some types of things that people could have faith in I think in themselves they could have faith in themselves they like to take things more into their hands than mm -hmm. anything else or above God okay okay and the Bible is a book that teaches us that we were created by God and therefore everything that we are in any fashion, should be centered around who he is. So faith must have an object. When we talk about the Christian, what then is the object of the Christian's faith? What is it the Christian God, believes? God is, is, who are, is the object of our faith. Okay. Okay. Would y'all, do y'all agree with that? Okay. God and, and, well, God is the word, but the, the word and what the word says and like mm -hmm. the promises that God gives, we have to have faith that those promises are are still going to unfold and be be done because okay. of who God is. Okay, so. very good. And, and, and it goes Go a little bit further that, you know, um, that, that that faith is extended through Jesus and what he did, mm -hmm. right? Because without that, the other is no good. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. So when we talk about faith in Christ, is it something that grows in the Christian as he learns about God, or how does that work? Because this parable says if a man has the faith the size of a mustard seed, he can move a tree. You know, what does that analogy mean? What is it describing? So uh, I do believe that our faith grows as we get to know God better, as we grow in our walk with him. Um, but when it's talking about the mustard seed, the mustard seed is very small yes. and it's saying that even if you have just a little bit of faith, if your faith is very small, but you trust God to take care of things, like it doesn't matter how small that faith is, he's going to do what he does. Okay. Very good. And, and Go I'll, I'll expand on that, that i had never noticed till I was getting ready to look at this, that this parable is sandwiched between two faith stories, sure right? We have this mustard seed story and then we have the the healing of the ten. That's right. Right. And so I was like, well, it's not a, it's not an accident that he put this here. Exactly. So they asked him uh, or they said to the Lord, increase our faith. And then we're about to learn 
how you do that, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. uh, we think it's just a knowing, right? But uh, something else is happening. Amen. Right. All right. Uh, um, also, when I was doing a study on when they asked increased our faith, I think the the um, the apostles that were asking, I don't think they were, I don't think they realized what they were asking. I think they were asking uh, Jesus for like some supernatural faith or some okay. super faith, you know. And I think Jesus began to tell them like. It's not what you need. Like you, if you just have something so small, you can, you know, make it happen with with the small faith. You don't need. I don't need to give you a, a superpower faith. Okay. You know. Oh, very good. I'm gonna ask you a very troublesome question through the generations of time. How is it? Do all men who and women? I don't mean to be gender specific. People that believe in God have faith in God. Well, okay. If if you go to um, James two, mm-hmm. okay, um, per, perhaps, but not a saving faith. Good. Right. There there is in theology and this thing in Christian that we call common faith. Okay, versus saving faith, saving grace. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, do you believe that there are people who go to church that believe they have found Christ but have not believed in Him yet? That is the saddest thing, but it's absolutely true. Amen. And Amen. I believe a lot of people use the Bible and church as more of a, I mean, you can use it as a motivation, but right. it's more than a motivation. It's like you said, um, Jesus is our Savior. You have to have the faith that that his, he died for our sins to, he, he had the, you have to have the faith that he died for our sins and that the things that played out were supposed to play out. You don't come to church just to get a motivation for the day, right. a good spunk for the day. Like it has to be something that's that's believed in, whether you're here or not, that you walk out your job, grocery store, whatever. It's not just a motivation. The Bible isn't just a book that you can pick pick up just to be motivated. It motivates you, but it's supposed to also save your life as well too. So. All right. So it's, t- it's something I noticed now that we can go and get certificates or certifications and things like motivational speaking. OK. Uh, and people like good motivational speakers because it does something to them. I don't know exactly what. But what is it that the word of God is designed to do to and for the Christian in your words, in your expression? It is to instruct us and correct us and um, be our guide of who he is and who we are and who we're supposed to strive to be. Okay, okay. And this word servant then comes, if he is our Lord and our master, then who are we to him? Servants. Amen. That's what we are. We are his servants, okay, and we do his bidding. Let me read these passage, this passage, this parable. Verse 7. Chapter 17, and which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not gather, rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and grid and gird yourself, I'm sorry, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterward you will eat and drink. Does he think that the servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. What do you see in this parable? What's there? What's the overall meaning, before we look into it, what's the overall meaning of this parable? We all have a role to play. Okay. Um, We, some of us, well, we're all servants to God, Mm -hmm. and we are supposed to serve others also, um, but we all have to know our role. We are not equal with God in any way, um, and we don't deserve the grace we've been given. Okay. And we don't need or shouldn't expect a pat on the back for doing the things that we're supposed to do. That he's told us to do. Excellent. Excellent. What else? Um, like a real world example that came to me when I was studying this, because at first I didn't, I was reading this. I was like, what you talking about, Jesus? I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, but one of the things my dad used to always tell me, I remember one day I asked him for an allowance. 
And uh, okay. he was like, what you want an allowance for? And I was like, you know, taking out the trash, getting good grades. Right. And he looked at me. He was like, so you want me to pay you to do something you're supposed to do? Mm-hmm. He was like, whether I pay you or not, it has to get done. Right. And I think that's kind of where I had the realization of what Jesus was saying. Like, you have a duty. I don't need a, you don't need extra hand claps for doing what you were supposed to do good anyway. Point. You know? And I had a, uh, I had also had a self-realization of, I was driving home from work. I'm a, a car salesman. All right. And I had a um, great week at work. And mm-hmm. I was, you know, feeling good about myself. Which right. you, it's okay to feel good about myself. Sure. And I'm giving myself all these high accolades, praises to myself. Then mm-hmm. it dawned on me. Mm-hmm. I was like, you didn't do nothing special. You just did your job. <laughs> like, you just did your <laughs> right. job. And if right. you do your job, good things happen. That's it. So that's kind of where I got on like what Jesus is telling, the, um, telling them in this. Okay. That's very good. That's very good. That's very good. No... The, the overall definition or defining this parable is that no one should be expect any or should expect anything uh, miraculous to happen to come from rather what they are supposed to do. Okay, how do we relate that to our duty to God and Christian? What is it that we're supposed to be being and be doing? I think, kind of like what you said, like. If you're a servant, be a servant. Mm-hmm. If you're, ma- you know, right. a master, but servants shouldn't try to be doing master work and, you know, Good everybody point, Deanna. again play your parts, do what you were commanded to do, mm-hmm. what you were meant to do, because mm-hmm. you were told to do. Okay, so in in this life as servants to God, what are a few of the things that's required at our hands? As servants, what is, what is the requirement in Christian? What are we called to be and do? We're called to show others Christ. Okay. Um, and by the by the way that we deal with them mm-hmm. and in relationship with them. Um, but we also talked about it in another parable that we have done. Um, you know, we're supposed to clothe people who need clothing. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to feed those that mm-hmm. need food and give drink to those who need Very drink. Um we're supposed to fill people's basic need in such a way that they see Christ in us okay. and through us, and it draws them to him. That's very good. That's very good. And, yeah. and something interesting here happens um, because, you know, we do a lot of different things around the church. Right. Uh, but something interesting in this parable is that there's no talk of gifts or, or anything like that. That's right. Um, this man, in fact, it's the opposite. This man worked the field. And then he came in, and he had to get cleaned up and get dressed and then serve food, serve right? Food. So um, we, we find that every now and again I'll say something like, I'm not going to do this, and it like, right, like I understand. be over VBS or something like that. Um, but, uh, yes, I will if that's what's required, right? Amen. If there's and, – and I think the leadership of this church does a pretty good job of filling the gaps on things yes. that we're not necessarily supposed to do. Right, I mean, it's not in it's our job say, description, yeah. if you will. That's good. That's good. That's real good. That's a good example. All of y'all's wording is right. A servant, we are called, there are other passages of scripture we could line alongside of this that would help us to better understand it because this is a short, a very short parable, but you have to read this one several times to kind of get what's really going on in here because it looks like the man is doing double duty. Like the servant, and I'm not going to ask you to come in from work and then set you down and I'll serve you, but you're going to continue. You served in one capacity. I'm only going to move you to servant into another capacity. One of the things the scripture says that the Lord, as, as his servants, us, we are called to be salt and light. You, you hit those things in your descriptive uh, and you are describing what it is that's required of us. So let's take that a little further. As servants, how, as servants to God, how are we light? What does that mean? To someone watching us, and we're trying to help them understand what a servant is, and we are to be sought in light as servants to God on the earth, what does it mean to be light? We illuminate Christ. They see Christ when they see us do or say whatever it is we're doing or saying. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I think just by doing those things, but showing love throughout, like genuine love, showing joy through it, 
showing that we actually care about them and serving the Lord, that it brings us that type of joy and love that's easy to show. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and you do that without grumbling, complaining, and all that kind of stuff. You, you want to be uh, a beacon that people right. come to, right? Like right. They, where they can look at you and say, that's light. You yes. Know? Uh, and, and later on, that comes with um, you'll counsel them and disciple mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. and all kinds of things because you're that light, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it, anybody could be darkness. Very easy right. to be darkness. Right. That's good. That's good. So there's a, a old verbiage uh, that people use sometime when they're trying to describe what it is uh, Christians ought to be that says uh, Christians are those people who preach the Bible and they use words when it's necessary. They only use words when it's necessary. So as the servants of the Most High God, would it be right for me to assess that people watch us? And what they are watching is our servanthood to the God that we say we love. So what should the salt of our light indicate to people that are watching us? Um, I was uh, talking to... um Brother Matthew one day, and he mm-hmm. was saying, you know, I'm going to stop telling people. Like, I'm going to stop telling people I'm Christian. Okay. I just want people to just see me and then assume that okay. I'm Christian, and then that'll let them know that. That'll first confirm to me that I'm doing the right active mm-hmm. duties uh, in my walk. And with that, it should, also, it's a, it should intrigue people to wonder, like, why is he or she like this? Right. As, like I said, for example, me coming to the church was through my wife because I wondered – how was she always calm? Why was she always so loving? Why was she always so kind? Because I didn't understand it. Right. And then she told me, God. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So it was nothing that she preached to me. It was nothing that she said to me. It was just how she carried herself. And, and through that, I saw the right. light. And then it began, began to salt me. That's good. And that's how my Christian walk started, just through her actions, not through her words or preaching. You saw what it was. I, I like that. And, you know, y'all had a conversation the other day, Pastor, about mm-hmm. vehicles. Yeah. And this is a very um, good illustration of this. Um, and you, you said, um, because of the stigma that comes with preachers, I would never own a Mercedes. Right. Though you can probably afford one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Um, if not, you could ask and somebody would give you one. Hey, probably. Right? Yes. Uh, but you would never do it because of, uh, especially in the black church, the stigma that comes with that. Right. And, um, you being salt would lose your flavor in some people's mouths mm-hmm. just by seeing that. That's it. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong or sinful or any of that kind of That's stuff right. about owning that, but just the stigma of it. So you won't do it. Though you might want to, and mm-hmm. it would be nice and enjoyable and all that stuff. Sure. You, you just don't do certain things. Uh, we, we've been talking a lot about what we're supposed to be doing, right. but also things that we're not supposed to Amen. do. Amen. Right? Amen. I love it. And like what Mr. Ben was saying, I like the fact that, you know, like you said, you could really, maybe you just really, that could be your dream car. You sure, maybe yeah. really want a Benz, but the simple fact that somebody in a congregation, it may ruin their taste. Right, right. And you 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 would rather put that aside to keep keep them flavorful, that's to right. keep them edified. That's so exactly you right. you won't yeah. kill the stigma, as Mr. Ben was saying. Amen. And so, to me, that's a sign of humility. Cool. And, and we are to be humble as Christ is. Um, and if, when you're rolling around in those things, you don't appear to be humble Mm -hmm. um and that's that's how i see that and then also i think about salt it's um to bring flavor um, and taste and the question has been posed to us over and over Mm -hmm. what flavor are you leaving that's good in people's mouths when they're done dealing with you i love it one one thing since we're talking about salt one thing that stuck out to me that um all, you know, all these parables are talking about masters and servants, or That's a right. lot of them are. Yeah, a lot of them And are. so uh, Jesus came, and he was the ultimate servant. Amen. Right? But in all these parables that we're doing, it's very much, um, no, here's what's coming. I'm the master, and you're the and servant. And you're the servant. And I, I prune, and I cut down trees, Absolutely. and I do all kinds of stuff. I scatter seed. I do all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, I looked at this backwards. I said, well, Jesus, um, while, while he's walking this life right. you know, through the Gospels, um, he was the ultimate servant. He was the Amen. best servant. Amen. And what that looks like is he didn't need to thank you for what he did. He mm-hmm. didn't need a pat on the back. He wasn't looking for his reward in heaven. That's right. He was just doing what his father told him to do. Love and it. because he did all those things perfectly, 
now he becomes the master. That's right. And so and so that salt, Amen. right? Like he he went through everything correctly, um, not selfishly. Uh, someone that's selfish is gross. Right. Like it, it leaves a nasty taste in yeah. your mouth, right? And so if you could do so, stuff unselfishly, Amen. then um, that's very salt-like. Amen. Amen. I, I 100% y'all. This is good stuff. So the, the servant does not look for these meritorious uh, pats on the back and those kinds of things that say, that a boy, you did a great job. You simply do your duty. I know um, one of the examples that came to my head of how mm -hmm. that's not supposed to look is um, when you see it in churches a lot. I haven't really, I never really have seen it here in True mm -hmm. Light, but I know it happens where people invite families or another person to the church. Right. And that's, of course, like you said, that's something we're supposed to do. We're supposed mm -hmm. to present them Correct. to Christ and try to get them into a church, invite them in. But a lot of people, you know, they can't wait to hey, pastor, can I come invite these mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. Can I come have these people stand up? And when you can hear it in their speech, they'll go from, hey, I invited these people. Look at these people I invited. Hey, can you guys send us so I can show them that I invited you? Right. And then you want that pat on the back of, oh, you're bringing people to mm -hmm. the church. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just do it, you mm -hmm. know. And that's I, it. That's an example of what it's not supposed to look like. And that's looking it. Looking for those, look at, I, look at me. That's right. You know? So when, whenever, whenever there is that, need. I'm feeling a need to, uh, I need to be recognized more. I need to, to be seen at higher. And when those kinds of things exist in a Christian's being, they had to use their mind to get there. They had to think a certain kind of way to get there. So when we're talking about the attitude of a servant, what is the thinking like of a servant? How does a servant think? Um, like you just said, you had to use your mind. So if you have to really contemplate on your mind, contemplating your mind to mm -hmm. get yourself these accolades, it's no longer serving the kingdom of God. It's serving yourself. It's yeah. it's a self agenda. It's no longer okay. God's agenda in a sense. I believe if you're using your own mind to contemplate, how can I how can I get people to see me? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that. It should be how can I get people to see okay. God? But when you do it that way, it takes away from the God agenda. It's a self agenda at that point. Amen. You become the selfish person. Every time. So, listener, uh, those who are watching us, who's, wa who's watching us um, in this particular parable, we want to communicate to you that it's really, really important how one thinks. Because would I be right to say that our actions follow our thinking? That we will be like we think. So how important is it for the Christian then to think rightly? And where do we get that thought from? How do we learn how to think rightly? Where's the coach? Who's the coach? God, and by being in your word. Amen. Um, so what you take in will come out. And so if you're taking in the word, if you're taking in um, listening to God speak when you pray, um, and those things, mm -hmm. then God is what will come out. But when you're putting the things of the world in, the selfishness and all that, that's what will come out. Okay, that's right on. Are you telling me that if I spend time here, and I, for those of you who are watching, you may not be able to see, but I'm laying my hand on my Bible, the Word of God, that if I spend time here with God, in the word of God, that he can train my thinking? Is that what you're telling me? How does that happen? Well, and I'll say it's a delicate balance, too, because mm -hmm. if you just do this, um, then you're thinking that will not be well. That's what this parable is teaching us. Yes. Right? If you want to increase your faith, you think a certain thing about God, you read his word and, and study his word and apply it to your life, and you do stuff. Hey. Right? And And... You know, we see it all the time in church that people are in church for years and they don't do anything. And there's just kind of a stagnant, mm -hmm. yeah. um, almost like you're, you're dragging a trash bag behind you, you know, like that's full or something. It's like you, you have to bring this along with you. And the people that are moving their feet, uh, they have the same problems as anybody Amen. else. Amen. But, um, but it changes the way that you think, right? Amen. It's it not does. all about me. Let me just, I'll just do I'm an unworthy servant. Let me just do what I have to do. 
Amen. Right. Amen. I agree with that fully. Quibble. I also think uh, when it comes to training your thinking for any ages, but especially younger generations, right. is important to to also rely on what the book says, what the Bible, what the Word of God says, but to find an elder who who spent more years thinking than you have, you know, because they can, I guess, enhance your thinking or let you know Correct. if you're thinking incorrectly and show you where to go find the right thoughts, you know. And yeah. I think it's also important once you find out um, if you're thinking correctly mm -hmm. and once you get fed well to go share it. Right. So you won't revert into the same thinking. Because I, I, I read a book called The Remedy of Life, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the quotes in the book was, the only way you can keep it is if you share it, or if you give it away. Yeah, give and it I away. think that's a very important way to train your thoughts. Like Once you get that fixed, go share it. That way you can f help the younger. That right. way they won't even have to get to the point you were at. Okay, very good. And, and I remember like mm -hmm. every major milestone in church where, um, where I felt like, like I needed to get going on right. something, was was not necessarily from the spoken word or in a Bible study. It was me. Like I remember when um, when I thought to myself, I need to become a deacon. It's okay. because I saw a, a deacon doing something. I was like, man, like he's just working for free and he's smiling and doing God's work. And I was like, I don't know what it is that he's doing. And I've been here three or four years at that right, time. Right. And but I was like, whatever that is, I want to do that. Right. You know, because he just. Uh, you know, and, and I was just watching him. Nobody would told me, like, here's what you are doing. So I was like, well, what is a deacon? Let's figure that out, you know. And yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So let me, let me turn a little bit in the parable. Because you have the servant in, in, initial, in the initiation of this parable uh, serving in one arena. And then having to understand that he has to change clothes and serve in another arena. How important is it for the servants of the Lord, the people of God, to understand that you may have to change lanes, that you have to be able to change from one thing to another? How important is that in the body of Christ? I think that, you know, you may be serving in one lane, and then you switch to another lane, and that person that was there in that second lane really needed to see you. So just going, doing what you're supposed to be doing, there's different people, but they may need to see you. And if you're missing, then... Okay, very good, Deanna. Because the Bible speaks that the Holy Spirit is the giver of gifts to the body of Christ. Uh, and it is just my personal belief, this is not, I'm not saying it because the Word says it, that... The scripture says that he gives several as he chooses. Yeah. So depending on who the person is and their ability to serve or their desire to serve, the Holy Spirit could possibly give them several yeah. gifts. Go ahead. And, and you don't know, like you, you can have a gift and you can even think you want to do something, but until you try a bunch of things, you don't really know. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm not real fond of kids. I don't like being around other people's right. kids. Me either. But I teach a VBS class, and, like, this is, I'm so excited about it. Like, this Amen. is so wonderful. Um, probably the be the one thing in church that I do that I love the most is Sunday school teaching. Yes. I love it. And, but I wasn't going to do that. I was supposed to be, I was supposed to help other people. We were supposed to study together. Right. I was supposed to fill in every now and again. And then things fell through, and then I did it, and I was like, oh, oh my God, I think God gifted me with this, you know. I think I need to do this more, you know. And so, and both of those were totally unexpected. Right, and right. And I'm finance director, and that falls like in fifth or sixth place on things I enjoy Amen. doing for the kingdom of God, Amen. right? And, and both the top two things I enjoy, um, you, you would not think that was my personality, that I wanted to do Amen. that. Right? Amen. I, I have watched Ben and Jessica and, and Deanna and learning to watch Quavo, watching him as he grows in the Lord. And these three I've watched a longer time. And... Uh, very, not very often do I get to see a person like yourself, like yourself, like yourself, who, who's lifted positionally in the church, but they become more humble. Usually when you see in the church people serving, when their servant area is granted a higher position of servanthood, 
you usually see their head go with it. Their thinking go with it. But I am pleased to say that I can see across the church body, when I have seen people in this church elevated to authority, that that has happened in very few cases. You know, the thing about authority, too, is um, the responsibility comes with that. Absolutely. Right? And so, um, like, I, I don't have enough time to have a, a lifted head. Amen. Right? Like, I got, well, yeah, I can sit here and brag on myself a minute, but, like, I got stuff to do. Amen. And I don't have time to sit in that chair. Amen. And, I agree. Um, Quick also, um, for myself, what I'm learning to do and what I was taught to do was just, especially when it comes to things of, uh, things of God and the kingdom is just be a yes man. Yeah. That way you can, you will figure out what your gift is. Like we were saying, if you just say yes to anything that's presented to you, that's, that's helping grow the kingdom, just say yes. And yeah. you know, it really is a, a big job, little job, a two day job, or just do it real quick. Just say yes to the things of God and you will learn what your gifts are. You will learn your place. And that's, that's where I'm at right now. Right. Just being saying yes to anything that's, that's offered to me that can help and, move the and, kingdom. Amen. And we see we've seen this already in these parables. Yes, that these parables have already changed two or three marriages for sure people in, that are doing that are sitting on the panel that did not want to do it. That's right. right? Like they absolutely 100 percent tried to get out of it. And it's like, no, just do, you've been here at church for a long time. Let's Come do on. it. Yeah, try Let's it. Do it. And they love it. They, 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 they want to do more of it. You know? <laughs> I love it. Well, Jessica. and to tag off of that, too. Um, you were talking about being a yes man, but that's part of you talking about changing lanes and just going with it. We're never supposed to stop serving. That's right. And so when you see a need, you just do it because we are to be continually serving. That is our role in this life until he calls us home. That's right. That's right. And, you know, one of the blessings, too, of being a part of the body of Christ and the, the sure thing that we are not is perfect. But the one of the things that I enjoy in this body as a shepherd, as the the pastor of this church, is that I feel so comfortable not knowing how to do some things and following people in this body that do know how to do that. Thing. It doesn't make me less a pastor. It doesn't make me less a person. It teaches me, though, that I can show them how to serve by following. So in this body, in this parable that we're looking at with the master and his servant, who's greater? The master or the servant? Who's greater? I would say definitely the master because... The servant can only say he's an unworthy servant, you know, um, but uh, he's he's getting there. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. the, 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 the good servant uh, comes close. Amen. Right. Amen. And in this, we learn and Christ taught us this because when his disciples were arguing over who was the greatest, who was going to be left in charge and all of this stuff, he simply got a wash bowl and towel. And he started washing their feet. The question is, listener, you who are watching us, is that the place your heart is? Can you lower yourself? That would be the world's verbiage. The biblical version would be, can you lift yourself? To wash your brother's feet. One last thing before we shut down this parable. I want y'all to speak to the people out there that's watching this. And I want you to communicate in them in a sentence or two. How important is it for the body of Christ, the church, to serve one another? How important is that? To be servants to one another. Deanna? I think if we're not servants to one another, the church will not grow. The church wow. will not get better. Will not wow. Grow. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else? That was excellent. And with that, everybody has to have a, everybody needs a friend. Yes, sir. You know, like, you think about you, Pastor, like, 
you're the pastor of the church, the uh, head pastor of the church, and it's like, we need to, as you're, as the congregation, we need to do our job into helping you. Like, it shouldn't be so much pastor do it, pastor do Amen. it, Amen. pastor Rayon to do agree. it, pastor James to do it, Mr. Ben to do it. Yeah. I, as myself, I'm not, I don't have any, I guess, accolades. I'm part mm-hmm. of the congregation, part mm-hmm. of the member, but mm-hmm. part of the family. But in any way that I can help make your service easier, any way I can help make, make Mr. Ben's service, like I should just, whatever I can do. Amen. Because it, it, it may bring other people along. Like, well, let me go help Quavo, help sure Pastor enough. Roy. Sure and then you can, I have five people helping me, help them, help you. And I love it, it just keeps going. You know, it's a cycle that you, you can't stop once, it, once it's done. I like your choice of words. It's a cycle. Uh, I, I want to highlight uh, a portion of what you said, how important it is uh, for the body of Christ to serve one another. All right. Um, after this, this parable, they, um, he heals the, nine, the ten. Yes. He sends them away um, to go do a work, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, go show yourselves to the priest. Mm-hmm. And so nine went and did the work, right. and one had faith. And he came back, right, um, and said, your faith has made you whole. So what we do in the church is different from um, volunteering at the food bank and um, United Way and all those type of places, That's right. right? Because um, work is useless and faith is useless. They have to be together. That's right. And, um, and that... So to me, that's why what we do in the church, Amen. every single thing in the church, is different than anything else that you could do. Because well, it's the only place good. that those two things are tied together. You better believe it. That is super, man. Y'all have been really, really exciting to listen to. And uh, listener and watcher, those of you who will tune into this uh, later on, we have a motto, a true life we live by, loving God and loving people. Substituting for the word love we could use the word serve. Serving God and serving people. We leave you with that. God bless you. God keep you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time here this evening. Talking over, musing over this parable of the master and his servant. For you are our Lord and we are bent on serving you. No excuses. None of them will work. You have called us to a specified duty to learn how to love you and to learn how to love people. And we will do everything in our power by using your power to do just that very thing. Help us, Lord. For if you don't, we have no way of getting there. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, listener. See you next time.